Hello everyone, it is I, everyone's favorite jack of all trades with the foul mouth, Commodore Urban, and thank you again for joining me. This uh, is going to be a very special, sorry, this is going to be a very special video, and I hope you guys will enjoy it as much as I'm going to enjoy making it. And before I begin, I just want to give a big shout out to all of my subscribers. Thank you so much for joining me. You know, part of my crew here. The reason why I fucking do this shit is for you guys. So before I begin with the book review, I got something I want to show you guys. And then I've been working on it for a little while. So, this. My large drawing of the SS United States. And yes, it's massive. It's 12 pieces of paper together. Six long, two high. And I really, I've been trying to really just go crazy with adding all the details. So, I hope I have this, I hope I have this son of a bitch done one day and then I'll show you guys the full extent of what, of what it will be. So, with that shit out of the way, the book I would like to review to you guys is an excellent book on the subject, A Man in His Ship, America's Greatest Naval Architect in His Quest to Build the SS United States by Stephen Uchi Fusa. This is a must. This is an amazing book. The story of a great American builder at the peak of his power in the 1940s and 1950s. William Francis Gibbs was considered America's best naval architect. His quest to build the finest, fastest, most beautiful ocean liner of his, of his time, the SS United States, was a topic of national fascination. When completed in 1952, the ship was hailed as a technological masterpiece at a time when Made in America meant the best. Gibbs was an American original on par with John Roebling of the Brooklyn Bridge and Frank Lloyd Wright of Falling Water. Forced to drop out of Harvard following his family's sudden financial ruin, he overcame deliberating shyness and lack of formal training to become the visionary creator of some of the finest ships in history. He spent 40 years dreaming of the ship that would become the SS United States. William Francis Gibbs was driven, relentless, and committed to excellence. He loved the ship, the ideal of it, and the realization of it. He devoted himself to making it the, epi the epony of luxury travel during the triumphant post-World War II era. Biographer Stephen Eugene Fusat brilliantly describes the way Gibbs worked and how his vision transformed an industry. A man in this ship is a tale of ingenuity and enterprise, a truly remarkable journey on land and sea. The book is split up in two books. This one book is two books. And the way it is split is book one is called The Man in the Vision. And book two is Building the Dream. What Mr. Yuji Fusa has been able to do was to bring the story of not just my favorite ocean liner, my lady, the SS United States, but to bring the story of her brilliant designer, William Francis Gibbs, to light as well. There's, there's a lot of information regarding this incredible man and there has been some other books and other stuff written about it, including Ye Shall Know Them by the Works, The Life and Ships of William Francis Gibbs, by the excellent legendary late Franco Brainerd. But, Mr. Yuji Fusa really goes into depth into the man's background, his history, basically chronicalizing his life. And I want to read you some snippets of this book to really show you guys the art form 
that this man, Mr. Yuji Fusa Stephen, really has put on fucking par. Excellent book, like I said, excellent book. I've got a few little sections here I'd like to uh, read here to you. Let's see if I can find them. I got a bunch of stuff marked in here. Uh, yeah, sorry guys, it's taking a moment. I should have. Alright, here we go. There's a good one right here. Huh. William Francis would later hint that he used the proportions of two famous German vessels, not the British ships, as models. One was Leviathan, a ship he had refurbished in the 1920s and knew well. The other was Europa, Bremen's surviving sister ship. Gibbs acknowledged a remarkable agreement in length and beam between design 12201 and the German ships. The variation being largely in the strength deck and the greater height of the superstructures above the strength deck in case of the Europa and in case of the Leviathan Europa. His lower, lighter superstructure would be an advantage. He also gave a ship a sh draft shallower than either of the two ships, a mere 31 feet. Okay. So. I mean, I mean, I could keep going and going and going, which, you know, I, I might as well. <laughs> Here's another one. This is a good one. Uh, Jack, what do you think? Blewett asked. We don't own her yet, Franklin said laughing. His face flushed with excitement. Not until the official trials in June were over would United States lines take possession of the completed ship. Damn you, Blewett answered, and the ocean tore by the ship's windows. Manning had opened their engines up to the contract-specified power level, but Franklin knew there was slightly more in, revert, in reserve. The high winds and pounding waves might put too much stress on the engines and propellers if she went full blower. Well, if you need advice about weather, Franklin told Blewett, there's a man just above you on the bridge, Captain Manning, who can supply the facts. Blewett sent a crewman up to the bridge. He came back to the captain's cabin and delivered Manning's response. You turn her up, I'll tell you when to shut her down. <laughs> it's absolutely just, you know, absolutely incredible. And here's another little snippet that I think is really good from a chapter of Very Fast Lady. In his letter to Kaplan, Bachman also quoted something written by Don Iden, but not published. This has been the maiden voyage, but the United States has behaved like no maiden. She is a very fast lady, a woman of the world, sleek, sophisticated, and maybe a little ruthless. Oh man, it just, I mean, you just, you know, little stuff like that, you just don't, you don't, it, it fucking, it's fucking good. Shit like this is fucking good, you know. Like right here. About when Manning pushed it a little too far. It says United States arrived in New York at 2.55 a.m. on August the 4th of 1952. Queen Elizabeth arrived 11 hours later, maintaining her scheduled service speed at 28 knots. Reports were all over Manning asking if there had been a race. There wasn't any race, the Commodore snorted. We just raced away from her. <laughs> oh my god, it's just... Uh, you know, Mr. Yuji Fusa, what he has done here is, you know, just, like I said, just absolutely, absolutely just an incredible book. I literally read this book, like, within, like, two or three days. It is that, that good. Absolutely that good. But, um, you know... There is probably one little other snippet or two I'll read real quick and I'll give you my final thoughts. And this one's kind of disturbing, so if you guys don't want to imagine this, which I don't either, but this is, this is what Mr. Yuji Fusa explained if the United States were to have been scrapped. If purchased by a scrapper after 40 years of waiting for a reprise, the United States would be towed away from the city of her designer's birth and dragged by her anchor chains 
onto a beach on the Gulf of Mexico. Here, the greatest American ship ever built will be ripped to pieces and melted down to make razor blades and bed springs. She would be demolished in the reverse of how she was built. The wreckers would start cutting, start their cutting away at the aluminum superstructure, sending the radar mast and the mighty smokestacks tumbling down. Oh God, I don't even like, I don't even like reading this. The bow and stern would be next, with a shower of sparks. Oh fuck! Large sections of the graceful steel hull would fall away from the ship and land with a thud onto the beach. As more of the ship is demolished, she would be hauled higher and higher on land. Finally, the mighty engines and bronze propellers would be harvested from the skeletal remains of the ship and then hauled away by truck to be melted down. After a year or so, the keel plates laid down on the Newport New Slipway No. 10 on a blustery February morning back in 1950 would be pulled from the mud and carted away. Oh, God, fuck, I can't read that. I hate that. Mr. Yuji Fusei, if you ever watched this, God, you gave me an awful image. I don't want to. I don't ever want to fucking see that. No, 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 no. That's a fucking horror show. I'm sorry, but you know it, it's very poignant. Very, very, very poignant. But I will. I will say this. My my thoughts. It is an absolutely a beautiful book. Beautifully written. Beautifully researched. And it's an absolute gem. I loved it. Like I said, I read it like in three days. So if you do get to watch this, Mr. Stephen Yuji Fusa, you have you have written a fucking incredible piece of literature that is worthy for any shelf of anybody who loves American history, who loves ocean liners, who loves maritime history, or just loves interesting stuff. Because the history of the FS United States and her designer, the late great William Francis Gibbs, is absolutely fucking interesting. And so, I salute you. Thank you for writing this book. I would love to meet you so I can get this signed. I would love that. Like I said, you know, it's a five-star book. Get it. Read it. I don't give a fuck how you get it. Just get it and read it. Two thumbs up. You will not be, you will not be disappointed. So, I hope you enjoyed this review of A Man in a Ship by Stephen Yujifusa. And yes, it is Yujifusa. Right there's the gentleman right there. That's the man who wrote this book. Absolutely brilliant man. Brilliant man, brilliant book. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, this is Commodore Irvin saying that smooth seas and clear sky. Happy sailing with you and God bless all of you. Until next time, so long my friends and uh, take care.